So welcome everyone. This is a particularly uh, auspicious welcome because it's not looking into a, not specifically looking into a camera and doing one of our virtual COVID era hybrid presentations or entirely online presentations. This is the first time Language Matters is back to meeting face to face since spring, since actually the early spring 2020. We shut off our last one was in February of 2020. So it's good to see people here sitting around a table and being able to have a live and in-person conversation. Again, uh, I, I think I know everyone sitting at the table, but just for reminders, my name is uh, Tomas Garza, Tom, as everyone knows, Tom Garza, and I'm uh, director of the Texas Language Center and also faculty in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies. I am so, so happy to welcome you to this, to our new iteration of the Fall Language Matters. We're hoping very much, already we know we've got some incredibly interesting and very diverse presentations coming down the pike, including one by our very own new Fulbright Scholar in Residence, Gideo Miselkin here is going to be giving our November Language Matters. Indeed, you should be able to pick up at the corner there the schedule of the upcoming events that will already have our uh, the October um, uh, schedule as well, but we have for, for November schedule with Kitty O. So, we're, we're we're up and running again for for uh, fall 2024. It's good to see everybody here and, and, and together. Uh, please do take um, uh, the schedule sheet with you just to have an easy and a cheat sheet, but also feel free to go anytime to the TLC website. All the updates are there. Keep your eyes out for the coming things like workshops, colloquia, but also for the upcoming professional development awards. We count on our language friendlies, drawing on those always limited, but nonetheless, we enjoy giving them out funds and the, the Texas Language Center Teaching Awards, which always which al which always goes to very deserving individuals <laughs> in our in, in our presence. Then we've got oh we've got a lot of award winners here. Now look around the room and whoo, we're we're rich here in, in uh, exquisite teaching. Well let me let me get to the matter at hand for today's language matters and I'm looking forward to a finally face to face discussion of uh, what I hope is an uh, a topic that some of you have been thinking about more recently. Um, the, the image, by the way, that's that's on the screen, the uh, we serve whites only know Spanish or Mexicans, is one that's it's actually now public domain uh, on the internet, but it's one that it, uh, I saw live and in person as a child in the town, almost identical, that with the exception didn't have Spanish, it's just Mexicans, um, in Refugio, Texas, where I grew up. I was a small boy, and the only is the irony upon ironies, the only Mexican restaurant in the little tiny downtown called La Rosa had a sign almost exactly like that up in 1964 when I was six years old. And remember asking my father, what, I don't, I don't quite understand what does this mean? And, and we had to sit on a particular side of the restaurant because the other side had this sign on it. So it was for whites only. Uh, it was assumed there would be no African Americans at all in the restaurant, but Mexicans would sit on this side of the restaurant, and so it was. And the first time I heard my father ever use a particular maledictum, he, the first time I think I ever heard the F word uh, from my father's lips was in reference to what this sign was, that he called it this effing sign. So I, I bring that up because what I want to talk about today, and you can fill in the brackets with your own languages, your own identities, of what is particular about your identity. It may be that you're an ally, and that would also be changed X while being an ally to the cause. Um, the, talk, the topic we have since the 2020s, in particular in the Black Lives Matter movements, the Me Too movement before it, has had a lot to do with who especially our learners are in identity, and I'm going to return to that subject. But I wanted to look at some contemporary research in particular on the subject of, of us as instructors of our own instructor or teacher identity in the class and asking that critical question that we, we've been encouraging our learners to ask in class and out of class of who am I? How do I present myself? How do I, how do I wish to be spoken to, referred to, interact with my group? But I wanna now put that turn the mirror around to ourselves reflectively and reflexively to say, who are we as instructors and start thinking about questions of instructor identity. I remember this article coming out in 1997. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, let me start by a definition, my bad, first slide here. It's a definition of what language teacher identity now, the most recent, there are a lot of, there's a lot out there doing a deep dive in 
uh, what's called now a field LTI, language teacher identity, but the most kind of uh, generalizably argued best definition is this one from Barthusian and company, uh, very recent from just last year. Language teacher identity or LTI refers to the way language teachers see themselves and understand who they are in relation to the work they do. Hang on to that for a bit in your, in your mind as we move a little further. It's also, thank goodness, the way others, including their colleagues, students, and inst institutions see them. There's a lot of implicit language within this somewhat opaque definition for a lot of us who work in DI, um, uh, DIAB fields uh, that Barcusa only starts to kind of chip in. And so I want to explain what, how I got interested in LTI years ago before it was called LTI and why now it's really important that we all come back to these early ideas. And now back to my 1997 definition, this piece that came out of all things in language and identity, it was actually such a such a publication back, back even in the 90s um, by an ESL instructor of South Asian, who identified South Asian, Indian in particular, an ESL instructor, now remember for those who is obviously some of his students not so aware, English is, yeah, it was going, yeah. <laughs> Say, oh, your English is so good. <laughs> oh, you from, from, pick your Kolkata from New Delhi. Your English is so good. Where did you learn it? At home, <laughs> because that's our first language. Um, he writes in his piece, and this was an extremely painful statement in 97, and it's funny because it re resonates today. I'm constantly being challenged on the rules of English grammar, and it seems to me that some of my students are waiting for me to make a mistake, that I'm viewed as the non-native informant in a class on English. Why do I want someone from India teaching me English? I want someone who speaks English, yikes, to teach me English. So before this idea of LTI was being formalized in the literature, there clearly this idea of who we are in the classroom. Each one of us could tell our own story that we could, you could each bring to the table something about when your own identity, whether this is about your ethnicity, your race, your sexual identity, your, uh, your, your class, your status in terms of, do you, are you, do you consider yourself a moneyed individual or are you yourself kind of, <laughs> More like the, the other 98% in, 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 the, in the world and in the room. Uh, I wanted to give a quick sampling of, so where does then the literature come down on the idea of LTI and to see if you can see, not so much in the Sesame Street world of which of these is not like the others, but what happens then to the questions that we've been asking all of our learners the last three years, who are you in terms of your identity? When we're asking teachers about their identities, what's missing? So here are a couple. And these are all quite recent. So uh, very recent from the Journal of Language Identity and Education. In order to understand language teaching and learning, we need to understand teachers. And in order to understand teachers, we need to have a clearer sense of who they are. Professional, cultural, political, and individual identities which they claim or which are assigned to them. And this is going back now to remember that first definition from Marcusian, which is just a few months old, really, from the last year. Is this, are you happy with just individual identities? It's a rhetorical question, but think about this. Individual identities is covering the same ideas, the same conceptual frames of racial identity, ethnic identity, class identity, um, uh, sexual identity, all of these different things that we've tried to raise to the front. Does that quite cover it if we say individual identity or not? And I just let that play in your mind because what's do we need to say, think more about who you are? Well, let's look at another one of these. This one done in graphic form. Um, Hassan Barassi in 2019 put this into schematic form of looking at identity, both at what happens internally and externally, that is in, kind of in the professional structure, whether it's our classrooms or at meetings at our institutions and what happens outside in our sort of personal life. And again, if you kind of go around the, the kind of spectrum that he, but they I should say they put together. There's a lot about who who we are institutionally, what support we get, where do we fit in as part of a larger organization? Yeah, organizationally, but not as much as we'd like to get about 
real identity of individual identity. This is so recent too. You know, it's not quite to BLM. We're still in 2019. KA IDAR's definition talks quite specifically. They have a very large study that goes into subcategories of identity. And in talking about LTI, language teacher identity, narrate three, oh, sorry, five different categories. Narrated identities. So narrate identities defined in our narrative context. These are particularly useful for those of us who are teaching literary topics, cultural topics that have textual references. How are How is identity communicated in the text? Identities in practice. It's basically who we are as we teach. Gendered identity. This is the only one so far that's been, you know, so this is being said by its name. Who are we in terms of how we see ourselves in gender terms? Our future selves, how we see ourselves potentially in the future. This has a lot to do with our positionalities if we're in tenured or non-tenure track positions, if we're in graduate positions versus faculty positions, if we are um in an organization that has unionization or one that does not allow or support unionized labor. And then social cultural identities, teacher identities within a particular focus and link between language and culture. Again, not with the exception of gender, not really grappling with the identity, with the issue really of identity as we I would like to see it. I think some of us that found the table would like to see it. Finally, so just from uh, again a couple of years ago now, and really Barbuzian's study, the one that I use at the beginning, that is 2022, is an entire volume, by the way, uh, on language teacher identity, the 22 volume. This is 21, an article that became a chapter in the new volume that tries again to using a schematic formulation of what language teacher educator identity is. And it talks pedagogy, it talks scholarship and research, it talks community and community service. And it talks about the institutional support. But again, in the center where the identity is, where are the markers of what makes up individual identity? And so I kind of throw that question back out again. If we have been telling our learners, dig deep, you know, know your identity, start to be able to express that identity linguistically in terms of the languages that we, not the language you use as your home language, your first language, but also the languages that we use and teach in our classroom, where is it in talking about ourselves? Why shouldn't we be as, in a sense, as trying to become as empowered as our learners are? So I'm hoping this is a call for us all as we think about how we want to present ourselves in our classes. If we are encouraging generous pronoun use, for example, do we ourselves make it clear who we are? Do we make it clear about our positionality if we want our students to be honest with us in first year, first semester exercises, like in the game of Russian, tell me about yourself. The very first, these first things of, I am this, I was born here. My mother is, I have two mothers, my father, my second mother, you know, do we do our, we, when we get to it, do we even talk about things like mixed families? Do we talk about things like divorce? Do we talk about things that are materials like um, two same-sex parents in the family. So let's go back to what we said about our learners and think of the good and what we're still what we're still missing that can help inform language teacher identity. So we know this this old school stuff again. Our language pro learner profiles so have radically changed from what God, it's just good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. From what they were, and I, I'm I'm. I'm Man, if I talk, go back to the 70s when I was taking Russian for the first time, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, to call it a, a classroom much smaller than this with only, I think, eight of us in the room plus the instructor, all white privileged with the exception of me. Um, the difference of who takes languages, especially less commonly taught languages, could not be more different then and now. And the then image I'm using is from 1990. So even as recently as 1990s, we still viewed, look, if you were learning a world language, you were fairly, you were thinking already about, well, you know, travel, uh, reading literature, reading the great books, to use the term, right? The classics, and not that kind of classics, right? <laughs> uh, then, and now our classrooms mercifully have begun to look a lot more like our university more at large. Yes, some of this has to do with the language requirement. Some of it has to do with, who we are institutionally in terms of our institutional identity, but our language classrooms look much more now like 
the population we're trying to serve. That's the good news. The question is, are we serving those individuals in the classroom that used to be monolithically moneyed, privileged, white, often, actually interesting, not largely male, but largely female, where the humanities and language study was considered to be not a profitable endeavor. And so fewer men would bother to take a language unless it was for profit. So how did we get to where we could talk meaningfully about learned identities? It goes a bit back, and I'm gonna, this is gonna be kind of down and dirty, but it's, it's kind of worth it, I think, to get a sense of how did we get fr from where to where we are now? I like to go back to this guy. So I like to go back to dead white men to see how much influence, <laughs> how much influence they really did have in some of the things that we most now attach to being woke and to, yes, I'm gonna say it because it's a, it's a well, it is being recorded, but uh, <laughs> to efforts of DIAB that a lot of the language we have is specifically a pushback, a kind of response to language being used in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, that told us, as we look back, what were we thinking back then? But Berlin, in all of his very intellectual greatness, has produced this wonderful book called The Hedgehog and the Fox, which is about Russian, uh, Russian literature specifically, but more largely kind of about the, the great European literary world, the classics, right? The, wor the works that we're supposed to read. This is why we learn languages, so that we can read the big books, the big dead white men again. And he says that that one of the ways to get at these great literary works is to start looking at who work, who writes them, who, who wrote these works, because it tells us a lot about who reads these works. He comes up with this clever idea. I think it's clever, even though it's a little bit, okay, it's a little bit narrow. It's binary, so it's already a little bit problematic. And he divides the literary world into hedgehogs and foxes. So foxes, he contends, are individuals, and think about yourself sitting at the table, that we that draws on a variety of experiences for and for whom the world cannot be reduced to a single idea. We are we see the world as a matrix. We see all kinds of things going on and we relate them to each other. Though if you're if you're in comparative literature, you you're already a fox by virtue of your field, right? But if you are always looking at Oh, that's interesting. Disposable plastic bottles. What does it say about our culture, right? And we're starting to compare things, look at matrices and interactions. The world is not one big idea, but rather a lot of small ideas that make up a larger thought. Hedgehogs are monolithic, claimed Berlin. They view the world through the lens of a single defining idea. The world is like this. And then he goes, okay, from the Russian world, so Dostoevsky, so the foxes, Dostoevsky, Plato, Dante, Proust, Nietzsche, and Ibsen, a, a longer list, but I wanted to give a few that I think most of us know, uh, of hedgehogs, Tolstoy, and that, by the way, that binary opposition of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky lives up to present day. It's always used like, are you a cat person or a dog person? Do you like hot dogs or hamburgers? Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, which one is it, right? So Tolstoy, Aristotle, Shakespeare, Erasmus, Goethe, and Joyce. And there they are, yes, every one of them, a dead white guy, because that was the world that Berlin was describing. So yes, a binary opposition worked for him in this particular concept uh, context, but it was just to be get, to be fair. From that same period, and this I think a lot of people really kind of blow a little bit mind blowing from the same world that gave you the binary white world of Berlin, Myers Briggs coming out of the wonderful world of very structural psychological. Um, I call it psychological war warfare, but it's kind of psych psychological definition from things like Skinner boxes, Skinnerian boxes, that all of personality types in any setting can be based, can be divided up into groupings and identified according to preferences that each of us makes when faced with a binary opposition. Now, what is different about their binary oppositions is that they do allow 50 shades of gray for all of the oppositions. So it's not simply saying, do you prefer to cook for yourself or eat out, but to allow for, well, most of the time I cook for myself, but I do enjoy a good meal out. So you can put us on the sliding scale where you are in the preference. So it does allow for that. So here were the kind, you've got the kind of, uh, I, I, this is a very simplified chart of what the MBTI is. Myers-Briggs type indicator really was a very long questionnaire. It's meant to be done. With you. Has anyone done an MBTI? By, oh, a few of you have. And so back in the State Department, we were required to. Everyone in the State Department had to know their type because it was supposed to be about team building. 
who we could work best with. I was supposed to, I'm, so I'm an ENTJ. Uh, I'm supposed to avoid, <laughs> because I'm a ridiculous extrovert, I'm supposed to avoid introverts for fear of overpowering them. <laughs> I find that offensive and I'll hit anyone who says otherwise. <laughs> so here were the here were the things of looking at how we interact with the world. Are we, and again, the categories are there are lots of shades of gray, introverts, extroverts. Do we are we sensory based or are we intuitive? Are we thinkers or feelers? Actually, that category is a very interesting one as it applies to learners. I'll come back to them in just a second. Thinkers or feelers, or are we judgers or perceivers? And by the way, careful with that one. It doesn't mean you're judgmental. It means judging, as in I'm going to use what I know about the world and make a, a judgment about judge, a, a ju you know, judge about this, or do I perceive something? Get, you know, get a little bit more feely there. What those binaries would come, or those ranges would come up with, was this matrix mm -hmm. that all of us fit into one of those categories, all along a sliding scale. As I said, I'm down down here as an ENTJ. If you're curious kind of where you want to fit, I can, I'll send you the slides or even a, so you can get online now. There are a lot of self-testing and BTI. Yeah. So it was moving us closer to the idea of looking at learner differences, but still, still very, very, still kind of binary in, in nature. A big shift takes place in, yay, finally, in the late 80s and early 90s by this guy, Howard Gardner. So Gardner, professor of, of edu both education and psychology at Harvard, produces a series, actually it's a series of books, but the big breakthrough one was in 83 frames of mind. The one that will follow up this one is right around 88, 89, called Multiple Intelligences, which posits from this book, a larger explication of this idea of multiple intelligences that each one of us is imbued with, according to Gardner. And just kind of sidebar, Gardner's research, he's one of these recipients of one of the so-called genius prizes, right, a MacArthur Fellowship. He received a MacArthur Fellowship in 82 to research underserved populations in the Boston public school system and to see what, why was it that the failure rate was so much higher among African-American and Latinx populations in these schools than, than the white counterparts in the same schools. It wasn't simply that the schools were either segregated, um, by, by by class, race, anything, but rather to say in the same school, why was it that the populations in this school would all be around this level as opposed to another school seemingly serving the same population that they would be at a higher level? What's going on? And Frames of Mind ultimately came up with the, the curriculum was teaching to one frame of mind. And if the student fit that frame, they would succeed if the student did not have that particular focus, they would not. And so the contention is, there exists a multitude of intelligences quite independent of each other, um, that each intelligence has its own strengths and constraints. And it looks something like a little bit, there are different ways of viewing this, but I kind of like this one. Again, looks more binary than multiple intelligences really is, but he tries to look at these as spatial intelligences, so they're not binary, right? And naturalist uh, um, um, intelligences musical, which takes into a whole, it doesn't just mean you can read music, it means that you might have an ear, it's often used for language acquisition, right? Can you can you hear accent? Are you good at pronouncing things, as we would often say, right? Can you hear a native speaker say something and then mimic well? Um, bodily kinesthetic things, are you a physical learner, you know, someone who learns well from doing? Linguistically oriented, are you better with charts? Uh, do you have good interpersonal skills, or is this not your, your strength, and so on. This research, multiple intelligence, finally is going to bring us to getting us close now to the 90s and 2000s, to the work of Betty Lieber and her notions of teaching the entire class. Her contention was in teaching the whole class, specifically regarding language, by the way, is focused to our, our endeavor, is that teaching, the whole class teaching, not a new methodology, but rather an approach that we take that permeates our syllabi, it permeates the materials we use, and most importantly, it permeates how we run class, how we do what we're doing in class. It subordinates, it says, method and definition of, appro of appropriate outcomes to student-specific learning needs re realized within a group setting in order to improve outcomes dramatically. That if we look at what our, well, this is now, now colloquially talked about learner-centered or learner-oriented instruction, 
that what what do our learners want and individually what do they how do they get there what do they need to be able to get there her conclusions were interesting the group of categories and i've tried to put them here so i don't want them to look as binary as that they're kind of being in opposition to one another environmental preferences and we do we all really think about these all of these because i like i don't i know i don't and kind of challenge yourself do we always think about things like so when do I do group work? When I do individual work? A lot of us do take that very seriously. Do we do we do better if the environment is really rowdy? I'm kind of up, never sitting down in class, moving around, getting in students' faces. Is that always good for our learners, for our students? If it's a, if it's an entire classroom of me, it's a very good thing. I want you to get in my face, and I want to get back in yours too. But if it's a group of students, if it's my wife, who is an excellent language learner, it's the worst thing you can do. Is get in her face. She would much rather take a book and sit quietly. And in about nine weeks, she will speak Russian better than I do. <laughs> Sadly, right? Uh, sensory modalities. Do we want students reading out loud or do they want to be read to? And again, each of you can think how how would you and if you were going back to learning a language again, what how would you behave? Verbal versus visual, hands-off versus hands-on, um, individual uh, individual work versus group work global looking at things like the entirety of a grammatical of field or specific details of a grammatical field. Get it, being given the rules first and then producing language or being given a text and deriving the grammar from those rules. Where do we fit in? All of this, all of this stuff going back to the 50s and up now to the 2000s and Lieber's categories is an answer to the fact that we do all of these in class. So LTI is as important as the same diversity we're experiencing among our students. And it is, it's one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite films from Come and Take It Day. If you haven't seen Come and Take It Day, go see it, go see it. And Jesse's line where he, where he kind of says, you know, what's what's wrong with San Antonio? Have we not, have we lost the fact that we don't remember anymore our roots? Well, we're a Mexican city. We're not a white city. We're a Mexican city in San Antonio. And Jesse's response is, well, you know, it's all about the hybridity, Gusares, in a wonderfully, hybrid statement. So what do we know about our learners that we might start thinking about ourselves presenting our own identities? We know about our students' intersectional identities, but the question is, are we addressing those? Do the materials we use or are being given to use, because often we, are, we don't have choice in what we get to teach from, with. Then we look at gender, of course, male, female, but also non-binary. We look at race and ethnicity as always majority white but also non-white and non-majority? Do we look at sexuality as only heteronormative in the way we teach and the materials we use? Or do we take into consideration non-hetero and using, I'm not happy, comfortable so much with it, heteronormativity, but heteronormative terms, do we include LGBTQIA plus in our materials and in how we run class? Economic positionality. This is one of the ones that I feel we're least our textbooks in particular and materials are least equipped to deal with. So I'll speak even from the Russian side. Russian textbook produced both in, in former Soviet states and here in this country, always have everyone think now about your French or Italian or German or whatever language you're teaching English textbooks. Russian textbooks always have, that we meet Ivan and we meet Masha and they're always in a really nice apartment in the middle of a big city. They always both have good jobs. Or if they don't both have jobs, well, then Masha's staying at home watching their 1.2 children and their 2.3 dogs. Uh, but they're always in a nice place. And we know if you have friends in Moscow, they're not all in the apartments, but these really nice apartments. They don't live in the center. They are struggling. They're taking working three jobs each. And that's going to be true almost all of all our culture. So wealth, class, and power are rarely represented as anything other than an ideal uh, and a kind of imagined ideal in our textbooks. Family centers, we still tend to focus on a nuclear family, scare quotes. Um, mom, a female mother, a male father, and their 1.2 children and 2.3 pets, often single parent families, not represented as much in non and traditional families, single sex couples, uh, same sex couples. Educational context as well. Uh, do we really take into consideration the educational history of our learners? First-gen students, those of us I know around this table, there are several, including myself, first-geners, um, and access to education in general. Uh, things like, do students know for things like, I, I, I smile with it because I'm speaking about myself here. When I applied to college for the first of my family and asked, 
my parents because I didn't know what a letter of recommendation was. They'd asked for three letters of rec. What is that? Who do I ask? Who get, who does it? Do I do I supply them? You know, what, what are these things? So all of those as aspects. Now, very quickly, our materials are, some of you have probably seen these kinds of things. We still have, think about the materials you probably used earlier today in your classes. I'm teaching Russian debate, and I know what I'm, the materials I'm using. They still present a majority culture. They are often patriarchal in their, in their uh, kind of co constituent parts. They're almost exclusively, in our, especially first year texts, gender binary. And we'll talk about men, women, and relations between those two, heteronormativity, economically empowered, again, and educationally privileged. Everyone goes to finish a school, everyone goes to college, everyone gets a good job after college in a lot of our textbooks. And just quick, three quick examples from texts that are in use around the country. This is one of uh, Holt McDougall's print uh, published text. Uh, from, this is from 2018 of that has a couple going out to eat. And if you're how your Spanish is, or the Olga's could be read, readable, is legible. But a couple going out to eat. And the whole thing is based around a, the joke that the guy is supposed to pay. And that's the entire point of the text is, oh, goodness, she's ordering more food than I've got money for. So I'm going to pretend that I left my wallet at home. And, mm -hmm, <laughs> and she steps up to pay. And that's the, the payoff at the end is Maribel saying, Enrique, this, uh, yo, si, yo si tengo dinero, yo pago. I'll pay. I've got money. Don't worry. And it's meant to be a kind of kick in the teeth of the, the toxic masculinity being portrayed by Enrique, who dies a thousand deaths because she's ordering food for 12 people, apparently. Right? She's ordering two main courses. This one, I hope I don't offend anyone here. I, get, I got Carl, Carl Bly's permission to use this, our own production of Frances Entractif from here. Yeah. So apparently, everyone around the table. And we're in lesson 11, they teach. Uh, if you study in our program in Lyon and you are sitting at the foot of the thinker, you must be a white woman. <laughs> Only white women study French apparently <laughs> and think, <laughs> or at least assume the position of the thinker. Again, the, the, the optics here are a little bit, yes, yes, it is to photograph. Got it, I get it. But, I, you know, having asked the person who took the group to Lyon that year, this was, I think, from 20, just before COVID, so I'm going to say 2019, was it really an all-female group? Yes, it was. It was an all-female group. Were they really all white? Yes. Yes. And in fact, these were, this happened to be a group of five out of the nine who went who were all white women. And then one from our, my own Russian background here from Galasa. Again, this is a, the section called Simia, the family, and yes, Get acquainted. Here are the here are our Russian families, and here we get to see everyone who's there. And it's always father, husband, wife, father, mother, the, the children. There is at least in the in the lexicon the words for step. It's one of the first in twenty says twenty twelve. The first time a step child was referred to in the usual definition. However, divorce is not talked about. Stepmother, stepfather are not in the lexicon, so you can be a stepchild, but apparently you don't have a <laughs> married into parent that's going to there. And God forbid there's anything other than heteronormativity being depicted in the images as well. So I'm going to finish with what do we want? Uh, schematic here, but it, there's a lot involved in the schema. This is both for our learners and back to you. I want to get back to LTI to finish with. So as we consider equity, social justice, and languages, and we want to think about the materials we project and how we pre present ourselves. What is our positionality that we want our students to see and understand? Think about, so the uh, identity intersection, yours and your learners. Think of gender, think of race, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, educational access, the family setting, and the list can be longer than that. There can be more. I'm talking about it and all the intersectional uh, uh, formulas that you can come up with there. And then think, does your syllabus reflect those? Does the and textbook here refer to all materials reflect those? Do the methods we're using in class reflect all of those? Or are we really still focused on the, right, everyone open, we're all on page X, looking at exercise Y, and here we go around the room. Are we still doing that? What's the interaction like in the class? Is it reflecting the diversity of instructors that we have? So I'll finish reminding us of Bell Hook. I'm sorry, I said Bell Hooks. Audrey Lorde, same, same, same ideology. 
and the same adoration for my part. Uh, Audrey Lord from her just groundbreaking work in 83, going all the way back, her wonderful quotation of there's no hierarchy of oppression. She was talking about her own identity and her positionality as a black, that she said, I am black, I am a woman, I am a lesbian. Now, how do we order that? You tell me. Do you prioritize my blackness? Do you prioritize my gender? Do you prioritize the fact that I'm a lesbian? Or, she said, I'd like to put a big smile, or do you want to think of me as a human? That would be nice. And then, was the quote, and then there's no hierarchy of oppressions. You can take them all at the same level because they all, they're all me, they're all who I am. And that's why I wish, I hope we can get to that with our learners, but I want us to get that to that level as well with ourselves here as well as our instructors. So with that, I want to leave time for it. <laughs> to say thanks for that, to give you a chance to put some stuff out. And I'd love to open it up for questions, discussion, comments, pushback, controversy, please, anything. I, 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 I'm an extrovert. <laughs> I love the country. Please start us off. Let's with start with the uh, Français Interactive picture. Yes. So I went to Lyon in 2019. Mm -hmm. I was the, one of the professors, and it was probably one of the most quiet. So maybe it wasn't this group. Am I, yes. am, was it really old? Okay, so yes. I asked Carl if I could use it. He goes, you know that's an old picture. I said, yeah, but it's on the website. And, and it's still on your point. website. Why don't we update this? We go to Lyon Thank every you. year. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I showed it to him and said, are you okay with this? And he said, no, <laughs> I said, but it's on your website. He goes, okay, okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it is embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Well, the fact that you're embarrassed is a good thing. And, I, and, and if, if indeed, if learners are, if they, if they laugh or giggle a bit, and it raises a difficult question or maybe a not so difficult question, all the better, all the better to bring out the, the questions of, well, what kind of what's wrong with this picture? Is this really who's is this who's in the room now as we sit in our classrooms, right? And that might be a good thing to say, you know, thank goodness, look at look at us now. Maybe things are getting are, maybe things are not as bad as the state legislature here in Texas wants us to see them as. Yeah. Thank you for that. Please chime in, chime in. Doesn't have to be pithy, just just something. <laughs> I don't need pith. I'm tired. I, I've had a long day too. I'm, I'll push back a little bit. Please push back. Um, <laughs> Please push back. Thank you, Chelsea. So as I, mean, I don't teach language, but I teach um, in uh, Slavic and Eurasian studies. Yes. And um, I think quite a bit about language as a, I learned Albanian, and I learned Albanian in Albania. And uh, most of my students uh, have a language requirement, um, it's a department. And, you know, I think about um, the presentation, which was really great, got me thinking in general about pedagogy and teaching in the classroom. And yet also thinking about Audrey Lord's quote and hierarchy of oppressions, but I think which is different though than explicitly naming what might be, um, yeah. what might hit a student differently if they, let's say, travel to regions yeah. to study, right? Yeah. And so also as a Black woman, right, recognizing what that means to be a Black woman, to be in the Balkans um, for the very handful of Black students that we get yeah. <laughs> who go to Eastern Europe. Yes. Um, it's something that we have to explicitly talk about and explicitly talk about Blackness in yes. a way that, yes. um, in fact, it, it is very unique to being Black in Eastern Europe, right? And so I think, too, it's something, I guess it's more not even necessarily a question, um, but just kind of thinking about um, how to both explicitly address this and talk about it and then two, how to talk about it with non-Black colleagues who tend to have a very hard time Correct. talking about it, especially after number three, um, incidents have occurred. Yes. So Repeat. I have served as both a mentor and then just a, because I'm the, you know, Black face, <laughs> the Black face in the region, um, with numerous students who have quite um, the struggles, um, on yeah. whether it's a study abroad or even like a longer term um, experience in the region. And, um, how then to deal with that, yeah. um, including one situation I know you know got physically aggressive and the student did not get much support at all. Yeah. Um, no, no, and so I, on the ground in particular. Exactly, exactly. Particular. And so, um, and then unfortunately, someone who over the last 16, 17 years I've been doing work, been attacked. Um, mm -hmm. How to then um, both grapple with that and still 
also though for students who still you know want to continue the pursuit and continue work yeah. how to make more space to have conversations about thank you so, that, um, so let me parse that just kind of quickly through the first part in particular to me is exactly to the point mm -hmm. is when there is a difference in perception of blackness or brownness or pick your pick your ish or ism from the list of identity intersectional markers um, that's precisely when conversations have should not just should occur but must occur mm -hmm. when there's a difference as we sit at a table between how even among say our students of color perceive themselves and each other those conversations should occur. If that difference is abroad, even more so for the Rush, former former Soviet states, the fact that there is one word, Chorni, that covers all the black, brown, even largely Central Asiatic population in the entire, this region that covers half the globe, around the globe, is a problem and needs to be talked about, especially if these students, as you say, are planning to go there. Second, if they are planning to go there, yeah, we have to have those difficult conversations up front mm -hmm. completely. So I, from my side, I've been till COVID taking a group for 18 summers, uh, Moscow Plus, always to Moscow and always with persons of color. Every single, from my first year in 93, had, um, brown and black people and Asian people have been in the group um, along with, with students who um, identified white and Almost every year we would have some incident because because we were in Moscow. Mm -hmm. Always it varied in in, in intensity or or right. severity, but we always had some incident. Mm -hmm. The good this is a bit of a sidebar, but I hope it's a little bit to your get, getting to your third point as well because being on that group and being in this, uh, I always have to not, I don't want my my voice to catch because it, it's actually some, something I've had to come to terms with around five years ago at the age of sixty finally uh, after years of living as a white passing Mexican, that it's a double-edged sword to be white passing. You get to you get a seat at the table much faster when you look like everyone else at the table, but you then have to hear the conversations that are being yeah. said about your peers. Yeah. Yeah. And well for me, so no one thinks I speak fun. Albania in Albania. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately I have to always hear people saying the awful things. Precisely. Um, and then decide to reveal whether Precisely. or not I can understand. So and you're right, it's a double-edged sword. It, it is very much a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And so when I would take students, my Mexican, some of my Mexican-American students who were not, who were, who were brown presenting, mm -hmm. uh, and we they would we would be in the same group, and they would get attacked and I wouldn't. It presented yet another. So I'm getting down to that. What do you do in sight? You must, it's like, like uh, you know, acting at, at the spur of the moment, you simply have to be ready with the difficult questions and difficult situations as they happen. Mm -hmm. We can't prepare well enough for them. We mm -hmm. can't mm -hmm. prepare well enough unless we start asking the questions now mm -hmm. about about identity and all. Yeah. And that's that to me is where the Lord, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, where you know the Audre Lord quotes quote still has teeth, and that is that we think about. All of our markers, all of the things that we say tell us who we are, and that we say that with not not just humility, but with pride of who we are, that it's not saying, well, you're lucky because you're black. They'll know you're not white. What do I do if they think I'm white and they start saying things about my brown skin colleagues or my black skin colleagues? What do I do? And Lord was simply saying, you're, you're 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 racializing this. You're making it about the color. It's not about that. It's about oppression. It's about either prejudice or ignorance, lack of information. And our job there still is going to be that to intervene. Yeah, I think I would just say, so I mean, please, it also please. kind of though, please. then it begins to kind of fall into the line of like multiculturalism, like we're all the same and we're all different, yeah. right? And I yeah. think. You know, I think it also is there was time to be more explicit and say, but yes, some of you are going to be very hyper Correct. from the moment you get off Correct. the plane. And there's a way that some things about your identity can be masked in a Correct. way that others cannot. And Correct. so like being able to name that, but also like how do we collectively respond as a result too, right? I think that that, but, but, but being very explicit about that. So yeah. like that student, right, yeah. was black and LGBTQ. Exactly. But was attacked and called the N word and yeah. because he was black, right? And right. so, I mean, I think it's right. like, 
recognizing and naming what, you know, but, but at the same time. And if that student had been equipped from first year Russian to exactly. be able to talk about <laughs> their identity, to be able not, and I'm not saying, because I always say, the last thing I want to teach you to do, especially if you're, if you're only, say, intermediate, mid level or lower, is this is not a time to fight back. This is not a time to now go into a verbal warfare situation with this individual. This is where you, you want to do the extraction mode. So you, but still that person needs the equipment, the linguistic and the cultural equipment to extricate themselves from the situation. Yeah. And we as educators need to be armed with the tools though to respond. To respond, correct, correct. And again, that's again where our identity does come to play, I think in the classroom as well. And it is not, again, it's, this is not a black, white uh, class. That all, it's about being who you are and representing that position in class so that your students feel as comfortable representing themselves in class. And and, and that it's as kind of part of the daily, you know, this is what we're going to do in here. You know, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not different from you. It also helps kind of decenter de who we are as instructors if we're one of the group rather than, again, like this, sitting at the head of the table. Kind of thing, yeah. That was terrific. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Other other comments, questions. Yeah, please, well, please. I'm just trying to remind uh, your your experience and your theory on the way we have been studying uh, like language on Russia. Yeah, please. And of course, <laughs> please. It's pretty super slow. But, oh yes. Uh, oh yes. I was just thinking of the way that, uh, like, you never um. Having some sort of educational institution, you have a standardized system of uh, checking the knowledge and have some tests and like regulating. So at that point, the objectivity is some sort of a, like the the marker to that you can uh, you are able as a teacher to um, to evaluate the progress of your students. Right. But as well, like when you are like the common knowledge in Russia is that you should be some sort of a, like a teacher is a vessel, not a person. You're more like knowledge construction system that you can like you can uh, represent knowledge to your students, but you are not able to like you're not able to uh, make it personal to tell who you are to express your sexual identity, gender identity, because it would not be like again this is some sort of politics, but it would be not that would be disloyal to the university yeah. as a system yeah. because like university is part of like yeah. big politics and all that stuff. So that point, I'm just trying, and but like the cover story is that they try to say that when you are personal to your students, yes, you became less objective. That's right. That's right. That's that, that, and, that, and and that's I think that's a push pushback that's uh, inherent to this discussion. Mm -hmm. Here, what, it doesn't matter where you are. So, but let me. I just because I I was also partly educated in the Soviet system, right under the so of my most of my Russian actually I got there rather than here. Um, I'm, what is kind of the text, the single text that probably has more impact here on uh, in this country on the both the DIA movement as well as in kind of thinking of critical pedagogy and language te teaching is came precisely out of roots not di that different from the Soviet system. This is Paulo Freire coming out of the Brazilian system of education saying, you know, this whole banking model kind of thing where te teacher again vessel. <laughs> And pumping him right, but yeah, but he really does make it into a transactional move. Is that teacher imparts knowledge, student collects the knowledge, and at the end, depending on how much you get, this student's better than that student, and we evaluate them. And he said, couldn't be worse for a system of education. Couldn't be worse because it devalues the human being and values instead the idea of collecting these tokens of knowledge, right? As he called them, tokens of knowledge. Um, so if you we take that text as Colonel, the Russian system hasn't yet embraced that text. I don't know if they ever will, or embrace this idea that um, decentering the teacher mm -hmm. may not be a bad idea. You're and they're, you're right. If we do stick to that system, to let the instructor know too much about the student would indeed prejudice then things like assessment and evaluation and possibly even interaction. But if we're not using that banking system for assessing our students, if I'm not counting up the tokens at the end of the semester, no, no, there's no danger. No, I'm, 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 and it's not a. This is not a pushback at all. This is simply a re, a re the other side 
this is, uh, you know, Frederick kind of as he said, he, he never called it a Soviet system, but he said the, the Brazilian, this was back in the, in the 60s, the Brazilian system of education is very, very, very autocratic. It's very top down. There's a universal syllabus. All schools will follow that curriculum and the textbook is the same and blah, 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 all the way down, right? And, and it's different now, but, but in the day, that's what it was. And he responded to this with the so-called pedagogy of the oppressed saying that singular top-down way does not is not egalitarian it does not provide equity among students especially students who don't have access to the materials or to the um, the kind of instructors that could could be bought that you could purchase as it were so an interesting story is that it's worth like um for example there was a story like i tried uh, there was a drama class on pronouns and i just yeah. decided to like to tell about the them yeah. the stuff yeah. uh except from the basic knowledge of like pronouns yes and yeah. then it like it boiled down to the debate to like the, like even the, with the zoomers even with like 19 20 years ago they started like fighting with that it's wrong it shouldn't be there like it's not part of like um conventional grammar usage and that was a big yeah. shock because this is like the moscow state university this is like the uh the, the main uh the harvard university. of russia yeah. people say yes <laughs> and at that point i was like i didn't like i didn't find the way how to um, change the attitude towards that and what is more important yeah. they can't um they are they are reluctant to change their view because they have this top-down um, approach into schools yeah. and it's easier for them to study cool. in this autocratic hierarchy yeah. educational system than when you try to ask their opinion yeah. or try to uh, decentralize like your um, teaching view the, yeah teaching authority yeah yeah so like what would be the ways to like to change the pattern of learning for the students uh, when they are uh, into that when they were raised into that kind of atmosphere at schools. So I'll use the the privilege of sitting at the head of the table and say as I look around the room, and I know everyone here, um, you're looking at a group of individuals here. We're also not we're not a collective in the sense of look, we're all exactly alike. We're ten individual people here, eleven people, however many there are here. You're looking at a group of individuals, each of whom has pushed back in their own classroom. And I think that's critical pedagogy, in my view, really does have to start instructor by instructor, class by class. Really does. Eventually, I hope we become more of a movement. And eventually, I think we can change institutions. At the moment, I, I think, again, I go back and say, I know certain of you have had experiences going to your head instructor, a particular uh, department chair, uh, the person who's saying that a coordinator of X level, whatever. And you've had this, or your own colleagues, and say, how about if we did this instead? And, or maybe not use this textbook, but how about these materials? How about some model? How about, let's, you know, rather than run this as a, you know, do a final exam, what if we'd have like performances at the end? Each student does a student centered environment. All of these conversations are occurring one on one on one at the moment. We're gaining some steam because we're also starting tiny steps. And I think it, we're at the moment, we're still two steps forward, three steps back, sometimes one forward. We're, we're trying to make ground. It's hard because precisely for the reasons you've said, following a prescribed curriculum and following a top-down model is actually easier for both instructor and in many ways for the student. It doesn't mean they're learning a damn thing though. Uh, this country is a pathetic example of how bad top-down instruction is. We have 200 years plus history of teaching language from a top-down model, mostly grammar-based, and everyone takes three, four years of high school X, and no one can say a damn thing. They can't order from a menu. Everyone takes, I took four years of French, and I can't say partly blue Francie. You know, I took four years of Spanish, and I can't say como tal, what como tal y vous? No, that's my French class. <laughs> Never mind, I don't know any Spanish. <laughs> Or the words I know in Spanish are guacamole, <laughs> Guadalupe. <laughs> so that's that to me was the, the, the kick in the teeth for my generation was how could we be going at this for so long and getting such poor results? Right? The infamous example for us was the taking of our embassy in uh, Tehran 
because no one in the embassy could speak Persian. What was th what were they thinking? <laughs> what were they thinking? An entire embassy staff that didn't know the local language. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, terrific point. The fact that it's it is still there because I go back. Well, until twenty twenty, would go back to these wonderful, venerable institutions and in Russia, and it's very hard to make difference there, even in very multicultural parts of the country. Yeah, it's not as though as the, the classes, you know, at all faculty are like very multicultural. They're very diverse. From all over the They're very diverse, especially at MGO. Yeah, yeah. Very, very diverse. But finally, again, and then there is another level of like all this political oppression yeah. and like some of the students from like the soldiers' children yeah. now are oh. going to the university and you should like, you should like, what how could you call it? Like this is not like censorship, but this you self-censor yourself yeah. coming to the class because you do not you do understand when you start talking about like there was garbage uh, anniversary and we started like we've read uh, we've been reading uh, the economist um, article on him and it was like a very positive looking view mm -hmm. and like for most of the class. Uh, the um, parents of the students were saying that Gorbachev was the reason why the system yeah. collapsed. Yeah. And there uh, was yeah. like, I was trying to like to give another perspective <laughs> on that. And they say, but my mother said, said ah. Well, you can't argue, you can't argue with that with this, the mother. No. <laughs> you understand that these yeah. are their personal stories. That's it was like her father is in the war, and you just okay, I would like to say that war is bad, but again, coming to her, that would be like Mm -hmm. Exit exit door for me as in right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no uh, uh, Russia certainly at the moment in particular is, right. is 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 not free from the difficult conversations mm -hmm. that we're talking about here. Absolutely right. Yeah. You're completely right. I mean they're not all that I I only remember them from my childhood, but I very much remember the, the way I would watch teachers censor themselves in, in classrooms during the Vietnam War, during the worst of it in 68, 69, that you couldn't that you couldn't ask or say certain things that young the young sisters and, and brothers of their big brother in Vietnam were saying about the war. We, we couldn't say any of that. And you could watch the teachers kind of do the, well, that's that's all very nice. <laughs> that's just and isn't it nice that Tommy's little that Tommy's brother is defending democracy. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh, oh yeah, he participated in the execution of it. No, stop talking. <laughs> yeah, but true. So true. Yeah. Hard times we're in. Any parting shots in our last seconds here from anyone? I could share a lot about share French. Any, share anything. <laughs> share anything from yeah. French. For division. 25 years, um, and uh, they come in with a idealized vision yeah. of what France is. Yeah. 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 Well, first they walk in and they see somebody that they're expecting to right. see, but right. it's not just that. It's, you've got to share your yeah. personal you know, anecdotes of being racially profiled at the airport every time, or uh, but how does a non- Brown person, black yeah. person. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. How well, so you, I mean, again, <laughs> like in the same vein that we went, this university went kicking and screaming into the era where we could, it finally had in the state of Texas at the largest university, the flagship university of the state, a Mexican American studies major. Oh, wow. Yeah. Jeez, it took us forever, yeah. forever to get that, yeah. that major. Uh, we finally, we have, <laughs> I'm so, of course, of course, but honestly, we finally, in what, 2012, 13, 14, somewhere there, finally taught Francophonie, that we finally had Sub-Saharan Africa represented and, and Northern Africa represented. We barely had any Caribbean French represented mm. in our Spanish department. The, the fact that Mexican Spanish was not represented in the teaching materials till 2010. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> what is wrong with that? Well, it's Argentine. We all speak Argentine or Spain. It's like, and all the people around the room who have names like Martinez and Gomez and Garza. <laughs> 
Twitter doesn't say talk to that at all. We don't use we don't use boss boss also, author, so I, <laughs> we don't use all of that nonsense. So no, it's I again tiny steps, and sometimes it is one step forward and two back. So thank you, thank you for doing that work because again, I know all of you are in the field slowly but gently and politely, ever so politely pushing forward, pushing things forward. So yeah, thank you for doing the good work. Can I say, of course, I, please. I, 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 learner. <laughs> um, I wanted to chime in about um, the material that I learned English with, which was, I think, color the view of the United States because yeah. it was incredibly diverse. And I am from Argentina. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> and I and I and I and I say down with voice. <laughs> But I do remember learning English and seeing Lizzie and Tom yeah, as yeah. my characters, that they did all this amazing after school activities and other things. I was like, I didn't even know they existed, like ballet and this, and the family lived in that spectacular place. Yep. And everything was amazing. And, and I learned English that way. So when you're talking about that, it kind of made me go back when I was young. I was like, wow. What a cool life, Lizzie and Tom. <laughs> and and like, all Americans like, live like that. We all live like that. Yes, it's true. It's like so um oh, so diverse. True. And he's like it created this like, oh, this this world is literally so advanced. Yeah. That's what I remember as a yeah. child. Like, what an advanced world. Yeah. And that's how mm -hmm. it color my view. <laughs> wow. Of the United wow. States. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. So I wanted to just kind of like flip that because it just totally and, and I may, if I may, Paula, I, yeah. I am remiss. I'm so sorry. I should have said at the beginning in introductions here. Of course, for those who have not, who do not know, well, of course, first that we welcome back Andra for a second term. We all remember her as our third. Assistant. It's my but third. Th third, my yeah. bad, third. <laughs> and of course, sitting next to her. Yes. <laughs> we So we have kind of two generations now here of our assistants in the TLC. So I'm so grateful to both of you for that, that help. But also for those who have not been formally introduced, Paula Boucher is, uh, as we say, the new and improved Betsy 2.0. <laughs> Betsy Brown had for 11 years been our amazing staff person in the TLC, and, and, and we ran a very, very exhaustive search to find the perfect person in Paula. We are so grateful who brings experience from the Benson Library and Lilas to our TLC. And we I, actually, honestly, I didn't think we could afford you. I'm so glad, I'm so glad you agreed to join us because um, I think you will, you're going to take us into the well past the 2020s in, 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 our, in, in the center and the work that we do here. So thank you. Not for everyone who hasn't had a chance to meet Paula, you'll be getting a lot of messaging from, from both her and from Andrew in the coming, coming weeks and months. I can't thank you all enough for coming thank to be you. here face to face. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.